Hello students, welcome back to the discussion of thermodynamics of open systems where we are talking about the application of the concept of chemical potential and we are applying those concepts to understand chemical reaction equilibrium. Now we have already seen how the chemical potential is, while it is a very general concept it cannot be measured uh, uh, easily as a result I would say that this concept is not practically implementable and therefore we had to devise alternative methods which are functions of these chemical potentials and in this uh, context we introduce the reaction Gibbs energy to predict the direction of a spontaneous chemical reaction and also to predict the condition of chemical reaction equilibrium. And then we found a quantity called the equilibrium constant which describes a chemical reaction at equilibrium. And in this lecture today we are going to study the response of chemical equilibria to external perturbation. And therefore our interest would be focused on how the temperature and pressure, these are the tunable quantities in the laboratory, how these quantities affect the equilibrium constant for a given chemical reaction. Now the response of equilibrium to changes in pressure and temperature has long been studied in uh, the literature and it has been reported in the literature and you probably have come across this very famous principle who is known, that is known as La Chatelier principle. The statement of this principle is as follows. If a system at equilibrium is disturbed by a change in temperature, pressure or the concentration of one of the components, the system will shift its equilibrium position so as to counteract the effect of the disturbance. Therefore, what it means is if a system is in equilibrium, in this case we are referring to chemical equilibrium, then if you increase the pressure, then the system proceeds to the forward direction if in the forward direction it can absorb this excess uh, temperature or if you increase the pressure the, uh, the chemical reaction will proceed in that direction where the effect of this excess pressure can be eliminated and so on and so forth. Now where did this principle come from? This principle is actually a summary of many many experimental observations that were collected and analyzed to find out a common thread in, uh, to explain how the equilibrium constant changed or how the equilibrium constant did not change. Now it would be our uh, responsibility to give a thermodynamic basis to the principle which is based entirely on experimental data. In order to do so, let me first take up the challenge of explaining temperature dependence of equilibrium constant. So where do we start from? We start from this expression that defines the equilibrium constant in terms of the standard reaction Gibbs energy at a given temperature. Now what does this particular uh, equation tell you? It tells you that K depends on the standard reaction Gibbs energy. Actually I can rewrite this by algebraically rearranging this equation. So ln k is equal to minus of 1 by r into 
the standard reaction gives energy divided by T. Now, what does this equation tell you? It tells you obviously K is a function of temperature. Now, why is that so? That is because temperature explicitly appears here. But what about the dependence on temperature of this quantity? Please remember that this quantity has been defined at a standard pressure and that is del G del Xi Tp. So, I would understand that delta R G naught for all practical purposes, this relates to the Gibbs free energy and Gibbs free energy is a function of temperature. Therefore, at a given uh, pressure, delta R G naught is a function of temperature as well. Therefore, if I want to understand why the equilibrium constant K should depend on temperature, I understand that its temperature dependence comes not only through the explicit term of temperature appearing in the numerator, but also because of the dependence of delta R G naught on temperature. Therefore, what I can do is I can take a derivative of ln k with respect to temperature and when I do so, the right hand side of the previous equation takes up the following form. But please remember that all throughout the definition of delta R G naught includes the fact that this is defined as the standard pressure and therefore, I could write d d t instead of del del t that is the partial pressure, uh, a partial differentiation with respect to t. I did not use that, but in general, I know that this equation, this relationship is possible. So, if for any given system, you are looking at the slope of delta R G naught by T with respect to T at a fixed pressure, you know that the slope is going to be equal to minus delta R H naught by T square. Have we seen this expression before? The answer is yes. We have seen this while we discussed the temperature and pressure dependence of Gibbs free energy and this is one of the forms of the uh, celebrated Gibbs Helmholtz equation. And in this expression delta R H naught it represents the standard reaction enthalpy. Now, if I use this expression into this equation, what should I get? The right hand side of the equation given here can be modified, can be simplified and I can write d l n k d t is equal to delta R H naught by R t square. So, as you see this equation is a famous equation and it is known as the Van Hoff equation. So, what is it that I have been able to achieve through this equation? This equation is in a differential form. I have the uh, situation where if I had a chemical equilibrium mixture maintained at a temperature T and pressure P and if I changed the temperature of that system the equilibrium constant would change by a, an infinitesimal amount. If the change in temperature is dt, that is temperature changes by an infinitesimal amount. And I am interested in estimating what is going to be d l n k dt. How will the quantity l n k vary with temperature? And I find that on the right hand side of the Van Hoff's equation, I have a numerator and a denominator. What is this numerator? The numerator is simply the standard reaction enthalpy 
And what is the denominator? The denominator is nothing but it depends on the universal gas constant and it depends on the square of the temperature at which you are measuring the transition of the system from T to T plus dt. Now in this form, it may not be most useful. So what one can do is one can integrate this equation. In order to do that, what we will do is we will write down d l n k that is equal to delta r h naught by r into d t by t square. If I can write this, then immediately I can do an integration on both sides where k would vary from k1 to k2 as t varies from t1 to t2. So what is going to be the result of this integration? I am going to have ln k2 minus ln k1 that is going to be equal to minus delta r h naught by r into 1 by t2 minus 1 by t1. I am sure all of you can carry out this very simple integration. So once we have done the integration, this is what we have got. And in this case, I would assume that let us say you are increasing the temperature, therefore T2 is greater than T1. Now let us go and see what the integrated form of Van't Hoff's equation imply. As far as its uh, application is concerned, you would understand then that the Van Hoff's equation can give predictions for both the exothermic as well as endothermic reactions. So let me first take the exothermic reaction and what do I have for exothermic reactions? In the case of exothermic reactions, heat is released when the products are formed, which means that delta R H naught, that is the standard reaction enthalpy, is going to be negative. If this is negative, if you look at this particular expression, what you find is if T2 is greater than T1, the quantity within the bracket that is positive, and therefore, when I have delta R H naught less than 0. I must be having ln k2 minus ln k1 less than 0 because this quantity makes the right hand side of this equation negative. And what is the consequence of having ln k2 minus ln k1 uh, less than 0? That means ln k2 must be less than ln k1. And of course, that means k2 is less than k1. So see what you have been able to predict from these equations. So all you are doing is you are increasing the temperature of the system from T1 to T2. At T1, the equilibrium constant of the system is k1. At the temperature T2, the equilibrium constant of the system is K2. And here I find for exothermic reactions, K2 is less than K1. Or in other words, the equilibrium constant K decreases with increasing temperature. Now let us go and revisit the uh, integrated form of Van Hoff's equation for an endothermic reaction. In the case of endothermic reaction, you do say that yes, in this case, delta R H naught, that, that is the standard reaction enthalpy is positive. The system 
goes in the forward direction, the reaction goes in the forward direction with the absorption of heat. What does it mean? It means that from the Van Hoff's equation, I can immediately say that if delta Rh0 is positive, anyway I have the term within bracket as positive. Therefore, ln k2 minus ln k1 that must be greater than 0. Or in other words, I will have ln k2 greater than ln k1. And this would mean that k2 is greater than k1. And immediately my conclusion would be k increases with increasing t. Now you may very easily ask me the question that from this mathematical formulation, are we obeying the, are we getting results that obey the La Chatelier principle? The answer is yes. For an exothermic reaction, what you have is when you are increasing the temperature, in that case, you understand that you are supplying excess heat to the reacting system. And this excess heat, in which direction can it be absorbed? It can be absorbed in the reverse direction. And therefore, upon increasing temperature, the equilibrium constant would decrease. Similarly, for an endothermic reaction, the forward reaction proceeds with absorption of heat. Now, with increasing temperature, therefore, the forward reaction will be more favorable because it is in the forward direction that the excess heat supplied to the reacting system can be absorbed. And therefore, I would say that yes, the La Chatelier principle actually tells me that K should increase with increasing temperature for endothermic reactions. And that is exactly what we have been able to show in terms of the Van Hoff's equation. Now that we understand the temperature dependence of equilibrium constant, now let us go and talk about the change in equilibrium constant K with pressure. Once again, I start from this relationship that the standard reaction, uh, uh, Gibbs reaction energy is related to minus RT ln K and delta Rg0, the standard uh, uh, reaction Gibbs energy is defined at the standard pressure, a constant pressure equal to 1 bar. Therefore, I would understand that delta R G naught is defined for a single standard pressure and it does not have any pressure dependence. And therefore, I would expect that del K del P T must be equal to 0. And I would say that the equilibrium constant will not show any pressure dependence at all if it is measured under isothermal condition. Now, this gives you some kind of uneasiness that does it violate the La Chatelier principle? Let us see whether the relationship that I have highlighted here, del K del P T equal to 0, is correlated, it, it co corroborates the prediction of La Chatelier principle. So, for this purpose, let me take a very simple example. So once again, I have a homogeneous gas phase reaction where one mole of A dissociates into two moles of B, both in the gas phase. And I am considering the chemical equilibrium between A and B. Let me denote alpha as a degree of dissociation of the reactant A. Then the La Chatelier principle, what does it say? It says if I increase pressure, alpha should decrease. The reason being here 
on the product side, you have an increase in the number of molecules and therefore an, the so-called increase in pressure. So more the reaction proceeds to the product side from A to B, you would expect that with the increasing number of uh, gas particles, gas molecules, that is where pressure will tend to increase in that direction. Therefore, if from outside, if you're increasing the pressure, the system would like to nullify the effect of this excess external pressure by moving the chemical equilibrium from B to A, whereby less number of gas molecules will be present. And therefore, the effect of this increase in pressure from outside would be nullified. And when B goes back to A, what happens to the degree of dissociation of A? It decreases. Therefore, the La Chatelier principle for this kind of situation as I have shown here, it predicts that alpha should decrease. And this is exactly what you would find if you plot the pressure as a function of the extent of dissociation as shown in this picture. So you find that always as you go on increasing pressure, alpha decreases. Uh, sorry, pressure, the degree of dissociation, alpha decreases. So that is the experimental observation which has been given in terms of the La Chatelier principle. But from standard reaction gives energy, we have seen that del K del P T is equal to zero. So once again, my uh, question is, are these two results in conflict with each other? The answer is no. So for this purpose, we have to understand what is happening in this case. As the pressure is increased, alpha is changing. And alpha is changing in such a way that K remains a constant. And therefore, we can very easily say that the decrease in alpha and the constancy of the equilibrium constant with pressure is not at all in conflict with each other. So in summary, this is what I would like to tell you. We have learned that in the case of a given chemical reaction, it would be extremely useful if we could say whether we are going to produce more product by either heat, heating the chemical reaction mixture or by increasing the pressure. Apart, as far as the temperature dependence is concerned, we understand that this is something very easy to predict. All you need to know is whether the system is exothermic or endothermic. If you have an endothermic reaction at hand, in that case, you would always expect more product as you carry out the reaction at higher temperature. Take the example of dissolving barium sulfate in water. Now, if you have barium sulfate in water, and therefore, what we have learned is if from a chemical reaction we re require more product, we need to know whether this chemical reaction is endothermic or exothermic and we cannot get more product by changing the pressure. So that concludes our discussion on chemical equilibrium where starting from chemical potential, we have gone all the way and derived the very important quantity which is the equilibrium constant and we have seen how experimentally the equilibrium constant can be varied either by changing the temperature 
or by changing the pressure and therefore giving a thermodynamic basis to the celebrated La Chatelier principle so widely known in the literature of thermodynamics. Thank you.